I am a professor in monetary policy and banking, but what I've been doing uh, lately for the last couple of years, I've gone back to trading and mostly I trade bonds. So I, if you ask me what I am or what I do right now, I'm more of a bond trader than a professor. So what we're going to be doing today is actually uh, going to be very, very high level uh, economic theory. I've split this into two parts. First, we're going to talk about the nature of inflation. How does it work? What does it do? And what's been going on? And then we're going to talk about the events that on a practical level. So it's going to be half and half. First, very high level theory. And then um, real practice and the way the world is being restructured. Now, this is important for me because I use a lot of theory to figure out what world we live in and how we function. Then once I've done that, I move on to how do I make my positions in terms of trading, what to buy, what to sell. So I personally think that year uh, 2021 was a year when we had a structural break, meaning that the world as we knew before has changed. We are no longer in a world we were uh, three years ago. So if you look at the past, for example, past century, I've here highlighted five dates that caused the world to change. So one of the, the first one is the creation of the Fed. So in 1913, which was the direct consequence of uh, the financial crisis and the financial meltdown of 1907, you had the creation of the central bank, the Federal Reserve System. Now, that changed the American landscape in terms of banking, in terms of monetary policy. In 1929, with the crash of the stock market, you had the start of Great Depression. So you had the banking crisis of 33, then you had another recession, as they called it, in 36. And overall, up to 1946, you had this period of low interest rates, low inflation, high unemployment, low investment, and the things were almost similar as we've had last 10 years, you know, low interest rates, low inflation, although we did not have a depression as it was in the 30s. Um, and this is US. A, a lot of these dates are also pertinent to the global scene, but as we shall see, somewhere more than others. I mean, Asia is different, especially China, and we'll touch a little upon that a little later. Then in 46, you basically moved away from the low interest rate, low inflation equilibrium, because what happened, all the American GIs, they went to Europe, fought the war, came back, got a lot of money, got jobs, and everyone started to spend. And if you look at the inflation in US in 45, 44, 45, 46, 47, you know, it goes from one, 2% to, uh, I think it was 16 or 18%. So all of a sudden there's huge inflation. Now this causes the interest rates to rise, but it also serves as a catapult for the economy. And you're propelled on almost 20 years of economic growth, technological development, and really good and fun times. And then in 1973, you have a new system which was basically caused by a policy error. What happened in 1973, the Fed behaved the thought that they can recreate the Phillips curve. So they said, okay, we have a rise in unemployment and we're just going to increase inflation. Now that was literally putting on gasoline to a fire. And that moved the economy from like a normal interest rate, to normal growth, normal inflation to a high inflation, low growth equilibrium, which was stagflation. And that thing Around that time, which was what we're going to uh, talk about, especially the late 70s, early 80s, you also have structural breaks in the Eastern Bloc in China. And we're going to see that the end of 80s, and we can look at it as, for example, in 1982 as a cutoff year, uh, we see that the world is starting to change. So what happened in the late 70s, early 80s, 
uh, Paul Walker broke the economy. He literally broke the US economy by raising interest rates and destroying inflation. And as bad as 1982 seemed, in retrospect, it served as a catapult. So, you know, you pull on a string and you release it. And then for the next 40 years, almost 40 years, we've had a decreasing interest rates with a lower inflation. And then you had a technological breakthrough of the 90s and things were just great. So you had this decreasing inflation and then a low inflation, decreasing interest rates and then low interest rate environment. What happened in 21, and this is basically where I'm basing all of my analysis on and all of my trading on, we were propelled out of that low inflation, low interest rate equilibrium into a higher inflation, higher interest rate equilibrium. Now, if you go piece by piece, and again, I'm talking mostly about Europe and US here, um, we are, some countries are in stagflation, some are not. So if we say, oh, this will be just like the 70s, the answer is not yet. Because if you look at the United States, does it have a higher inflation? Yes. Does it have a higher interest rate? Yes. But does it have negative or lower economic growth? Well, the answer is not really. I mean, if you look at the, the recent GDP data for US, that came out you know, above 2%, so business as usual. However, if you look at uh, Germany's economy, they have the highest interest rate since the highest inflation, I'm sorry, since the 50s, and they have negative economic growth. So is Germany in stagflation? I mean, it's too early to say, but it certainly looks like that. On the other hand, is US in stagflation? No. But what is obvious, so we, I'm not arguing we're going to relive the 70s, but what I am arguing is that the world has changed. So we're not going to have uh, zero interest rates, uh, exceptionally expensive monetary policy we have had for the last 10 years. So when are we going to see quantitative easing again? It's going to take a long time. So this thing that lasted for a long time, you know, just buying government bonds, printing money, and nothing happening, that plays on. So the games, as the Americans would say, the Elvis has left the building. So we are now, again, what I believe and what I'm talking about is, we're now in a different structure of the economy. And not just US and Europe, but in global economy as well. And we're going to go through the inflation and then we're going to see how the world is changing, especially from this financial perspective that I. So the, one of the, the titles of the presentation was we're going to talk about structural inflation. Now, I'm not going to say, you know, what is inflation and how it works. I mean, we all know that. But what I'm going to say is inflation basically tells us everything about the economy. So if you look at the long-term rates of inflation, and I'm talking not five years, I'm talking 10, 20 years, you can see what is going on. And you basically have a low inflation and a high inflation state. The low inflation state means that inflation is caused by natural frictions in the economy. Now, natural frictions being just regular changes in the economy. If you have higher inflation, there's something wrong. So over time, the economy undergoes long-term structural changes and the sources of the economy tell us which, uh, the sources of inflation, I'm sorry, tell us which part of the structure of the economy is changing. So if you look at the what is known as the preferred uh, price index, the EC, uh, the Fed is using the so-called PCE. I mean, this is about over 60 years. So as we, as I said, you have the rise in inflation, you know, in the 60s, it was again, you know, one, one and a half, half, and then it starts to rise in the early 70s, and then it goes down. So this thing here was what you could call a transitory inflation, but then you have the Fed mistake. And this leads to a 10-year of inflationary instability 
and of structural problems for the economy. But then from the 80s, you basically have very low inflation. I mean, here where inflation goes up, goes down, it's two and a half. Then in mid 90s, it's again, it goes to 1%, goes to two, goes to one. Then you have a brief inflationary episode in 2006 and seven. Then you have deflation because of great financial crisis. And then you have this, you know, a persistent inflation below 2%. So why is this? Why is this possible? The answer is actually simple. And we're gonna look at it on the next slide. But what we have now is this, kaboom. So all of a sudden you basically have the inflation you did not see in the last 40 years, and it is decreasing. So there's no doubt that raising interest rates and decreasing economic activity because of the rise in interest rates is going to decrease inflation. The question is, where will this inflation stop? Will it go back down to you know between zero and a half two percent, or will it linger on at three, four, five percent as we have had here in late 60s, early 70s? My argument is that it's going to say stay high. We're not gonna see a precipitous drop below two and a half percent of inflation in US, and we're not gonna see that in Europe now. In order to know why this will not happen, we need to explain how this has happened. How did we have such a low inflation for almost 30, and we can even argue 40 years, as I've said, since 1972? Well, let's look at the structure of the actual inflation. So the core inflation is you have the CPI, Consumer Price Index. Now, the Consumer Price Index has these two volatile components, which is energy and food. Now you have a bad harvest, you have a flood, you have a drought, the price of food goes up. Or there's some whatever stuff happening with oil, oil goes up and then it goes down. So in order to see that these couple of goods don't distort everything else, there's something called core or you know basic inflation. Now, this is from 2001, from 2000 till 2023. And what do you see? So you have if your core CPI is always, you know, between one and 3%. But if you look, if you split core services versus core goods, you have two completely different pictures. So you have that goods are basically deflationary. So you see here how goods are really negative, they're a little positive, then they're negative, negative, and all this period, they're negative. What does that mean? It means that the price of actual goods is becoming more and more cheaper in the United States. And you, this is, to understand this, it's real easy. I mean, what was the price of a computer or of a cell phone in the 80s, 90s, and now? Same thing with stuff like clothing. You know, what was the price of Levi's or Nike's or whatever? It's going down. But then on the other hand, what's happening with services? Well, services are perpetual, you know, permanently inflationary. You know, you're seeing above 3% pretty much all the time. Why? What, what is, looking at this, what does this tell us? How is this possible? Well, the answer is the system we have had in the past was a highly globalized system. So globalization started in early 80s and continued till 2021. Now, that means that the manufacturing jobs were leaving the US, were leaving Europe, and were going to Asia, namely China. Now, why was this good for everyone? Well, it meant that people in China, for example, were getting jobs and their salaries were going up, while the people in US or Europe were getting cheap goods. Well, obviously, if you lose jobs, you have to create new jobs. Well, in order to create new jobs, and if you're not producing goods, then you got to produce services. So what U.S. and Europe have oriented, they moved from a <clears throat> manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy. And getting jobs and services 
basically meant that you could raise salaries and people's standard of living was going up. So the Western world was orienting more towards services with service salaries going up. The Eastern world was orienting more towards good with their standard of living and salaries going up. And the net result were price of services going up in the West, price of goods going down, and overall average inflation being negligible. So I remember <clears throat> I was in the US in the 90s. A lot of people were saying how China's taking jobs and how US will become poor, how there will be no jobs in the US. Well, that's not true. If you take the percentage of employment, it's been constant. So pretty much equal number of population is working percentage-wise, but the number of actual jobs is constantly increasing. So as the population of US is growing, about 45% of the people are working and it's constantly 45%, regardless is the number of population, 200 million, 250 or above 300 million, meaning constantly new jobs are being created in the US. So we do not have a collapse of the Western economy because the manufacturing jobs have left. So what did we have or what did we had for the last 40 years? We've had low inflation, a rise of economic power in Asia, and an improvement in standard of living of the West. Well, if you look at it from a theoretical point of view, this is pretty much aligned with something called real business cycle theory. Now, the real business cycle theory is basically exactly what it says. It's based on a real business cycle, meaning that your business cycle is driven not by fiscal and monetary policy, but it's driven by technological improvement. Now, if you take out the 2006 and 8 inflationary period, and you take the banking crisis, which pretty much ended in 2010, and you take out the euro crisis, which is the continuation, this was what's happening in the last 40 years. You had low inflation, low interest rate, and environment driven by productivity. Now, there was um, a lot of talk about secular stagnation, meaning that the growth rates are not that high. Well, that's also fairly easy to understand and fairly easy to explain. Why? Well, again, if you're losing manufacturing jobs, your growth goes down. But if you're gaining uh, service jobs, your growth goes up. So you have a negative growth from manufacturing, a positive growth from services, and the overall growth rate was positive, but it was fairly low because you had a negative uh, and a larger positive, so it was some positive. It wasn't that you, that the, world as we know it had you know both pl all pluses so it wasn't the fact that we had a plus in uh, both manufacturing and services no you had a plus in services and a minus in manufacturing but overall it there were positive growth rates so again as we're seeing what are we seeing we are seeing uh pretty much a simple explanation for everything. Well, this has changed. Now, what is structural inflation? Structural inflation is inflation caused by the very nature and the structure of the economy. If economy is highly functioning, if everything is working out well, if everything is you have a normal non-distortionary fiscal policy, normal non-distortionary monetary policy, the economy functions. Well, if the economy is out of sync, if there's something changing the structure, then you have the economy itself simply becomes distorted. And inflation is a manifestation of this distortion. So what we have had for the last 40 years in Europe and in US was a highly functioning, well-oiled economic machine to use the Ray Dalio's uh, expression. 
Well, this machine is now becoming less and less oil. So up to 21, globalization prices, globalization kept prices down. Wages really, uh, real employment and the economy were growing and jobs creation moved through goods and services. Well, now we have a different setup. We have a different setup, we have a different economy. So inflation will remain elevated. The main cause of inflation will come from the supply side. Interest rates will rise and they will remain elevated and the standard of living will decrease. Why? Well, the first sentence here says, globalization kept prices of goods down. Now, this has changed completely. We are no longer living in a globalized world. We are living in a world that is becoming deglobalized, meaning that all the positive effects of globalization are now going to be reversed. And you, somebody's going to say, okay, but how do you know this? Well, give me five or six slides. And I'll explain my reasoning in that. So the Western economies are basically being restructured. They will have to start functioning in a deglobalized world. And because of that, they will have to change. Now, to be again in balance, there will be a period of, again, higher inflation, higher interest rates, which will be fairly costly for the West. Now, if you look at this, I mentioned that the world is going to get deglobalized. So if you look at the causes of structural inflation, again, structural inflation is where an economic structure in itself is inflationary. So the way the economy functions, the way it's structured, it cannot have a zero or 2% inflation. It has to have five or 6% inflation. So there are four sources of structural inflation. One is general disequilibrium. Now this is pretty much where economy falls apart. That can be economically due to hyperinflation, like for example, Weimar Republic where Germany had a crazy inflation rates, or I'm sure you've known Zimbabwe and places like that, or because of war, stuff like that. We don't have that. What we have are the next three, partial disequilibrium and external shock. In this case, this is one and the same. Because the world is getting deglobalized, there's partial disequilibrium in segments of economy. So for example, in Europe, everyone was getting cheap gas from uh, Russia. That's no longer happening. We got to get new ways of uh, gas. Even if that gas doesn't go up in terms of prices, you have to build and restructure the network, yeah. making the transportation of gas more expensive. Then you have um, chips or goods. For example, you need from Russia like lithium, or goods being produced in China. So if China says, look, we want less Western companies, then these Western companies will have to go someplace else. So this, a problem in one segment of the economy is causing the problem in other segments of the economy. That's why it's partial disequilibrium. And since it's not happening in an economy, but it's happening on a global scale, that's why it's external shock. Now, as time goes by, you will also have the, uh, the expectations because what will happen is, as inflation, just a second. Allergies, I'm sorry. As inflation is higher, people will get used to higher inflation. So although we are not seeing that, I mean, if you look at the inflationary expectations in US and even in Europe, they're, you know, the five-year expectations around 3%, which they've always been there. And the one-year um, inflationary expectations are precipitously coming down. Unless the inflation really falls down to 2%, which I've argued it won't, um, inflationary expectations will go up and will remain higher. So what we have here is this is the theoretical explanation of the structural inflation. Now, 
one of the things that I pay a lot of attention to, and this is the thing that I've seen in Yugoslavia, and that's a problem is, if you have high inflation, it restructures the economy. Now, how does it restructure the economy? Well, some sectors of the economy become more favorable for investments or for development, like for example, renting, while other sectors of the economy become less favorable, like for example, um, manufacturing. One of the big problems, or in my view, the biggest problem is actually uh, banking. So what happens is it's really easy to see how higher inflation can cause higher inflation. And we're going to focus on this negative loop between banks and companies. Now, if inflation is persistently higher, higher than the rate of depreciation in companies, then depreciation becomes income and not expense for the companies. And that's, let's do an extreme example. So, you know, you bought a computer for whatever, hundred dollars and you're gonna depreciate it 50% annually. So in two years, you wrote off the computer. Well, what if inflation is thousand percent? So your one year computer, it, the new computer is no longer a thousand, a hundred dollars, it is a thousand dollars. And a one year computer is no longer $50, but $500. So your depreciation and amortization actually become positive. So as they become positive, you all of a sudden, instead of depreciation expense, you have a depreciation income. And this is highly dangerous when it comes to buildings. So if you have a persistent inflation, the price of real estate is gonna go up. And as the price of real estate goes up, your, val your collateral value will go up. Meaning that a building is worth a million dollars and then because of inflation in a couple of years is worth $2 million. And then because of inflation in a couple of years is worth $4 million. So if you have something like this, then your value of collateral for banks becomes increasing, meaning you're more and more a good client for a bank. Now, why is this so dangerous? Because it creates an inflationary negative loop. So high inflation leads to stagflation and decrease of real production. Real production leads to decrease in profitability. Since the nominal increase of prices cannot follow the rise of production costs, both labor and goods. So over time, the inflation is, if the inflation is higher than the depreciation rates, then depreciation becomes positive and is no longer caused by an income from companies. Now, positive depreciation increases profitability for companies. And this is where bad things start. So if you have a decrease in real, I'm gonna allow, say this loudly, decrease in real sales, but an increase in nominal sales, that means your business is going down. But because of inflation, you're selling it for more money. And then to kind of boost your profitability, you have positive depreciation. So when this starts to happen, you basically enter a negative loop where companies are weaker and weaker, but they're more and more profitable. And they need money to cover their expenses. So how do they do it? Well, they go to a bank and they say, oh, we have this value of a collateral. My building's worth a million dollars. Give me a half a million dollar loan. Well, then inflation goes up. The building is no longer worth half a million dollars. It's worth $4 million. So uh, you go to a bank and you say, <laughs> okay, I have this loan of half a million, but my collateral is now worth four. Give me another $2 million loan. And if this happens, if you enter this kind of a negative inflationary loop between companies whose profit is being boosted by positive depreciation, and you enter a relationship with banks where banks are gonna fund you simply because they don't wanna 
have a bad loan, then you have a huge problem. And this is basically what happened, for example, in Yugoslavia in 1980s. So Yugoslavia had four, four extremely successful anti-inflationary programs. So inflation was high, and then government made a reforms, and inflation went down. And it happened four times. And every single program was exceptionally successful. Now, someone's going to say, well, Nevin, if you needed four of them in 10 years, how come they were successful? Well, they were successful in decreasing inflation, but they were not successful in changing the structure of the economy. So what has happened is what I mentioned. The banks simply needed to fund companies and companies simply needed inflation in order to exist. Because the moment inflation would go down, the companies would have to face their own reality. And nobody, absolutely nobody wanted that. And I'm not saying this is happening in Europe, but this is what I am looking at. So when quarterly reports come out, I pay a lot of attention, or annual as it is now, I pay a lot of attention to depreciation and is it increasing or decreasing in companies? Because the moment depreciation becomes positive because companies revalue their assets, then you have this doom loop that God knows how it's going to end. So if um, you look at the monetary and fiscal policy on the structural inflation, how do you basically do it? Well, for example, monetary policy has to be neutral, not necessarily restrictive. So interest rates have to be higher because you have higher inflation. So you need to have positive real interest rates, but it should not choke off and destroy economy. So if we're talking about the optimal monetary policy under structural inflation, you need to have a higher interest rates, have real interest rates positive, but, but you do not want to have an exceptional restrictive monetary policy as it was during Walker because you don't want to destroy, you know, the economy. You don't want to choke off the economy. And what about the fiscal policy? Well, the fiscal policy needs to be focused on restructuring the economy under a new deglobalized regime. So you basically need to say, okay, if I'm moving away my production from China, if I'm moving away my production from other BRIC countries, who are my allies and how do I, what is now known as onshoring instead of offshoring? How do I, who's gonna produce chips? Who's gonna produce cars? Can we replace gas with something else? Now these, this is on one slide, which, for lack of a better expression, is derogatory. Because it, it truly is an incredibly complex issue. Now, I do not have sufficient knowledge or mental capacity to solve all of it, but these are the main uh, pointers. And here I'd like to stop. And we're now going to move into <clears throat> away from this um, high-level theory into more practical things. So one of the things that, as I've said, has to be looked, and this is like the final, the, 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 the expression, the straw that breaks the camel's back. So if you have a connection between banks and lending to zombie companies, there, then you're into this doom loop of inflation. And the only way the system can continue to exist is through higher inflation. So this is the bad thing. Now, as I said, this is not happening right now. I don't know if it is going to happen and I don't know how bad things are gonna get, but let's look what the monetary policies in the West world have done so far. So monetary policy did exactly what was expected. They raised the interest rates. However, this is not enough. So inflation is not coming from a demand side. It did initially. Now it's more coming from a supply side. 
but it's not coming from you know the global supply chains. No, it's coming from the changes in the structure of global economy. So, what did Fed do, right? So Fed, you know, from 1980s, we've seen interest rates coming down. Now, if you're a trader, this is a classical bear bear market because you have a higher you constantly have lower highs, you know, inflation, interest rates go up, go down, then they go up, but they don't go up as much. So they go down, they go up, but they don't go up as much. Well, this has ended. So the interest rates, as I said, have gone up. The Fed is probably done raising interest rates. They might do it a couple of more times over a span of next year or two, or they even might move into normalization of monetary policy. But normalization of monetary policy is not going to mean this. The Fed funds rate is not going to go down to zero again. What it does mean is that they're going to stop raising interest rates, maybe decrease a quarter, but that's it. We're not going to see a flip of monetary policy and interest rates coming insanely down simply because inflation cannot go down. So the Fed is not gonna move into quantitative easing in, when inflation rate is about 5%. It's not gonna move into quantitative easing if inflation rate is about 3%. So that's not gonna fly. So at best, we're gonna see a stabilization of interest rates or maybe a slight decrease, a quarter or a half a percent. But this thing, that's all. ECB, and this is a all time chart because ECB exists only from 98. So if you look, interest rates are now here at above 3% and the ECB said they're gonna raise it two more times. So it is expected for the ECB interest rates to go up to an all time high. And again, we're gonna see the same thing. This play of you know, zero and then negative, negative, negative interest rates, that's not gonna happen again. It simply won't. So ECB, as other central banks has done, what central banks would do under an inflationary environment, they would raise interest rates. But the notion, and I've seen, I see that in the stock market, the notion that all of a sudden the uh, interest rates are gonna collapse and we're gonna go back to zero and have quantitative easing. No, that's not gonna happen. And the rest of the presentation, we're gonna be talking about why that is not gonna happen. So in terms of inflation, especially for me, I'm from Yugoslavia, uh, this is kind of a been there, done that thing. So if you look at, Everything that is happening now, especially in Europe, for me, it's really reminiscent of United States in, uh, in I'm sorry, Yugoslavia in 1980s. So again, we're gonna go back to that late 70s, early 80s period. And if you look at that period, the Eastern Bloc was split into three things. Three parts. So you had the real Eastern Bloc, Soviet Union, its satellites. You had China and you had Yugoslavia. And everyone chose a different path at that time. The Eastern Bloc and the USSR, because at that time, I missed the sentence, at that time, the socialism, the whole thing, reached its upper limit of development. It needed to be transformed. So the Eastern Bloc was too heavily ideological and couldn't change. So basically they remained on the same course, which ended with a complete collapse in the 90s. Yugoslavia said, which was pretty much a free market economy and had this hybrid socialism in terms of ownership of the companies where workers were the owners of the companies, but did not have central planning and it had a lot of free market principles, moved away from free market principles, more towards central planning, and that ended up with a war. Now, China basically did the third thing, and they had this sentence, the weird sentence, capitalism, yes, democracy, no. And China is the only one that basically 
did manage to successfully transform its economy into something completely new. So we have a communism socialism economy with no democracy, but with high level of capitalism. And this brings us to what I would like to call uh, high school principle. So as we have seen, the consequence of globalization is this. China, manufacturing makes up roughly 25% of China's GDP, higher than Japan, 20%, and higher than Germany, 18%. Now, if you look at um, G7, G7 is basically a snow white and six dwarfs. So you have US, which is huge, you know, huge, an incredibly big country, and you have the other six countries, which are fairly small. Now, what happened in the 80s, and especially in the 90s, all these Eastern Asian economies started to grow. And, you know, China's one, India's the other one. So as they started to grow, they became more and more powerful economically, and they demanded their own global position. Because if you know, if you look at India, India is larger than France, Italy, UK, Germany, and all these are G7 countries. So in high school, uh, if the cool kids don't want to hang out with you, you basically find some other kids to hang out with you. And this is what happened with BRIC or BRICS. So US and G7 said, we want to share, we want to maintain our both economic hegemony and political hegemony, and we're going to rule the world. You other kids, scoot away. We're not going to hang out with you. So the other kids formed a club of their own. Now, the other kids, you know, initially it was Brazil, Russia, India, China are now expanding. And there's like 13 other countries that want to join BRICS. Turkey being one of them, Mexico being one of them. But if you look at size, G7 is $40 trillion. Now, G7 is also represented by the entire EU. So you can say that it's $47 trillion. Well, BRIC, which only has four countries, is almost 23. So that's the size of US. Or it's larger than all these countries together. So if you look at China, it's larger than all these countries together. India, it's larger than you know three of these countries. So someone, G7 would have either had to reform and kick two countries out or remove from G7 and become G9, G10. Well, it never did that. So now we have BRICS, which will pretty much, with all the new members, have an economic power of $30, $35 trillion and be equal or close to G7 and EU. And this is the deglobalization element. So BRIC countries are basically saying, Okay, cool kids, you don't want to hang out with us. You want to exploit us for cheap labor and cheap goods. Well, now we're going to start a club of our own. And now we this is where we come to a magical world. One of the main policies of G7 and one of the really powerful policies of G7 is the process that has now started and is known as de-dollarization. Now, People, if you if you listen to people who talk about de-dollarization, they're making a mistake. They're constantly saying, well, nobody's going to replace US as a reserve currency. Well, you basically can't do that. But what you can do is replace US as a transactional currency. So Let's discuss these two elements. So what is a reserve currency? A reserve currency is where you put all your assets in terms of savings, call it a storage, right? And central banks do this all the time. So a lot of central banks will have assets in bonds, but will have assets in foreign currency. Usually, 
it is the US dollar. Or in case of, for example, Croatia, which is highly close to European Union before we adopted Euro, we were in Euros. But European Central Banks, European Central Bank keeps a portion of their assets in dollars. Also, you have large companies, you have a high wealth individuals, they're gonna keep their wealth in dollars. I do that. I mean, all of my money is in dollars. So that's a reserve currency. So I want I own uh, dollar denominated stocks, dollar denominated bonds. Well, what is transactional currency? Well, transactional currency means that you use dollar as a transaction. Now, as I've said, the process of de-dollarization in terms of removing the dollar as a global reserve currency is not going to happen. And it cannot happen in the next the last 10 years. It cannot happen because the G7 is still too large. There's no way that, for example, Bank of China, of Canada or um, Bank of England is going to say we're not going to keep dollars. So you cannot remove dollars as a reserve currency. But what BRIC countries are trying to do with their partners is to remove dollar as a means of transactions. And this de-dollarization will succeed. And this de-dollarization will have huge, large negative consequences for the Western world. The fact that dollar, the transactional use of dollars is going to decrease, will have a significant impact for our growth. Now, here's why. Ever since the fall of the Bretton Woods, which was the early 70s, U.S. has served as an engine for global, war, uh, global growth. And U.S., since the 70s, started to have a permanent trade and budget deficit. Now, what is the implication of this and meaning of this for the rest of the world? Well, U.S. was consuming more than it was producing. That's a trade deficit. And this was really good for U.S. because, you know, you produce 100, but you, you consume 103. But consequently, this allowed the rest of the world to produce more. So you basically had that you were producing 100 and needed 100, but now all of a sudden you could export to U.S. so you could produce 102 and hire more workers and increase your standard of living. This is how the Chinese economic growth occurred. Everyone, you know, was exporting to U.S. However, you basically needed to fund U.S. consumption, and you did that through the purchase of U.S. debt. So the dollars were leaving the U.S. US through trade deficit, but they were kind of coming back through the purchase of U.S. debt. And because of this U.S trade deficit, U.S. was serving as a motor of global growth. So if you look at, this is a discontinued series, but I'm just showing it as a illustrative point. You know, you see from the 80s, the U.S. you know, trade account becomes negative and just goes down. So someone needed to produce all this. At the same time, U.S. debt just explodes. So what was going on? Well, here you had that U.S. was a significant part of global economy. And then from the 80s, that is decreasing. And then from the 2000s, it's really decreasing. So think of it in these numbers, right? Let's say you have that the U.S. is producing 30% of global GDP, and it has a 3% deficit. That means it's, we're gonna round it up, and let's go 1.3%. That means it's consuming 1% of global GDP percent extra, because it's 30% of global economy, but it has a 3% deficit, so it's consuming 31.3% of world's goods. Well, the other rest of the world is producing 70% of global 
goods, but it's exporting that one extra uh, percent to US, meaning that it has one and a half percent growth of GDP of their GDP higher. So because the US was consuming more than it was producing, and it was such a significant part of the global economy, it was basically being the motor for global growth. Well, over time, as we're seeing, the participation of US, the economy in global GDP is decreasing. So what does de-dollarization mean? Well, the implication of the twin deficit is as follows. If US was consuming more than it was using, that means that it was shipping dollars more than it was producing. So it was shipping dollars outside of the economy. So outside of their economy. So that's a trade deficit. You sell your dollars to buy some other goods. Great. So the dollar was flowing into the global economy. Now, portion of that dollar was used for transactions and portion of that dollar was used as reserve currency. Now, if you own currency, it's not making you any money, so you wanna buy US debt. So a portion of dollars remained in the world, it's used for transactions, and portion of dollars returned and funded US debt. And that's where you have, you know, for example, you could uh, see that, uh, there's statistics how China owed one owned, I'm sorry, owned 1.3 trillion of US debt. Now it owns only 800 billion of US debt. So over time, this reliance of US debt is decreasing. And at the same time, the now the transactional use of dollars is being threatened. So what does that mean? That means that the countries that are using the dollar are no longer using the dollar. So let's say that if you had a hundred dollars, let's say you're Saudi Arabia or oil company here in Croatia that purchases oil and you have a hundred dollars and you say, okay, I have a hundred dollars and I use this for transactions. Well, let's say you go and you de-dollarize. So you say, okay, I don't need a hundred dollars anymore. Now I can have $60, meaning $40 go back to the source. So now all these dollars are flowing back into the U.S. And because they're flowing into the U.S., they're causing inflation. And because they're flowing into the U.S., the uh, Federal Reserve needs to absorb them. Meaning, as BRICS succeed in more and more de-dollarization, there will be more and more dollars to absorb by the Federal Reserve. So if the Federal Reserve is conducting such quantitative tightening, that means you cannot decrease interest rates, and that means you cannot have a stimulative monetary policy. Also, U.S. economy will have to deleverage and the interest rates will rise on U.S. debt and will stay higher. Now, as the interest rates on U.S. debt rise, they will also rise on European debt, meaning that there will be less investment and there will be less employment and there will be less consumption. So the way things are right now, we are faced in a highly a uh, polarized world between BRIC countries on one side and G7 on the other side, with where G7 has exceptionally high levels of debt, the other side doesn't want to buy anymore. So the countries will have to go through a fiscal consolidation, and this fiscal consolidation will lead to, let's say, a decade of lower economic growth. So if you tie all this together, you basically see that globalization led to low inflation and economic growth. Well, now it's going to lead to higher inflation. And with higher levels of debt, the interest rates won't be able to decrease. 
the central banks will have to conduct quantitative tightening, and this will cause a decrease in economic growth in Europe and in uh, the US. On the other hand, as world is becoming deglobalized, that by definition means the other side, which is BRIC countries or and their alliances, will also suffer some elements of decreasing growth, but they will try to c compensate that with a joint cooperation. Now, what will be the total magnitude of this? That still remains to be seen. But so far, this is basically the world we are uh, right now at this point. So de-dollarization uh, of dollar, decrease in use of dollar in terms of transactional currency, deglobalization, and onshoring of production. Now, as I've said, fiscal policy here becomes key because it's not just a fiscal policy in terms of, uh, you know, what do you do with your budget? It is also how do you structure your legislation and what kind of investments you promote. For example, uh, Europe is promoting a lot of investments in green energy, which I think is uh, a good idea, but a political mistake. You, uh, Europe should promote more investments in terms of onshoring production and pulling production from China. Now, again, I'm... I trade on the market, so politicians are always good for me because the more bad things they do, I better do in the market. But overall, in terms of globalization, we're entering in a period of restructuring of the global system. So just like globalization was restructuring, it lasted for 40 years, we're not gonna have deglobalization, which might last you know, for five, 10 years, and then we'll have two blocks or anything in between. So. As Bugs Bunny would say, uh, that's all folks.